Greetings to all colleagues with a special greeting to the DVC of Teaching and Learning, Prof. Zonga, distinguished guests, and all protocol observed. I am Brenda Digama, a senior lecturer in the discipline of clinical anatomy at the School of Laboratory Medicine and Medical Sciences in the College of Health Sciences in this host university. The title of my presentation is Maintaining a Supine Position During Teaching and Learning Online An Anatomous Reflection of Teaching. The layout of my presentation will begin by defining what supine versus prone positions are, underpinning theories, selected ones, my position as a presenter, my pre-COVID experience, the COVID experience, the post-COVID experience, and I'll discuss a few points and conclude. To define supine and prone positions, prone position refers to a person lying flat on their front, which means the face is facing down. Lying flat on their back facing up is a supine position. Underpinning theories, I've selected those from Anderson et al. from 2000, uh, which reflects in it uh, different aspects of the student and teacher interrelation in the production of knowledge as a content interface. What you'll notice in that figure by Anderson is that it highlights key role players, which are the student and the teacher performing different roles. With the one from Picciano 2021, which reflects a learning community, it, uh, it reflects six pillars that are important for e-learning, which is the content creation, which is normally placed in learning management systems, social and emotional environment, which is created normally in a face-to-face -face teaching environment to tutorials, and also any advices that are given to student and lecturer consultations. It allows for self-paced and independent study, which we see a lot of during e-learning, where the student has to interface with uploaded e-resources to engage with. Then there's the dialectic or questioning, which allows us for discussion. And in my reflection, I've used this in my teaching when I introduced question and answer session with the students, which allowed us to discuss any areas for clarity and, and to expand on any contents. Then there is the reflection. Reflection both for myself as a teacher and a student, and some use blogs and journals to reflect on their experience. For me, it was a personal reflection where I look back from 2020 up until now. Collaboration refers to all student-generated content. It's when there's collaboration between myself as a teacher and the student, and we discuss a topic which will allow for knowledge to be collaborated. This you will see as I carry on with my presentation happened in one of the modules that I have coordinate and teach in where I allowed for discussions on body donation to occur uh, within the students. My position as a presenter, I am an anatomist. I am based in the discipline of clinical anatomy, which is a foundation for medicine and medical sciences. It is traditionally taught through face-to-face -face teaching, cadaver dissection and prosections, and that is the norm that we were used to. Advances over the years have reflected an introduction of blastinates, which are, uh, are formed through the process of blastination, plastic models that students can interface with, um, skeletal material, and we have seen also more recently the introduction of augmented reality through uh, one example is primal pictures, which we are used to in our college, and the vis visible body, and also virtual reality, which is created by the Organon Institute. How was our, my pre-COVID experience? My pre-COVID experience goes back to 2012, when I first came back as an academic in this university, and it involved similar traditional methods. As you can see, the dissection on, uh, on my left, and below it are the prosected specimen showing both the model and also the specimen itself reflecting the same structures that are on the model. You then see the face-to-face -face intervention uh, that happens there with the teacher, interfacing with students and using a model in place in the center. Then osteological material, which is, and we've got a lot of material through the Acklands videos that the students can access, which covers the whole human body, and also using the plastic models as well, which show intricate structures. The COVID experience has been an interesting one, I must say. I will just go through and use Khalil's 2018, where he reflected on anatomy blended learning. And you will see in my presentation that there are green crosses and there are red ticks. The green crosses reflect what we're not able to do during the COVID or pandemic time, whereas the red ticks are reflecting what we're able to do. If we begin with cadaver-based learning, and I have said already it's our traditional method, we could not do that in the laboratory because, of course, because of lockdown, 
we could not have students come into the lab. However, we're able to explore peer teaching where online demonstrators uh, were put in place and demonstrators would engage with students online and reflect the different parts of the human body to show them. However, we couldn't have the students virtually dissect. With group learning, we're able to explore team-based, problem-based through Zoom and its breakout rooms. And we're able, for instance, and at 110, we were talking about the relevance of cadavers in a digital learning space, if there was still a space for them. And that allowed students to be able to express themselves and interact as peers. Computer-assisted learning, I think this was the most prominent in our COVID experience because we had resources in place thanks to our university. We had UTLO, which helped me a lot in being trained because the first response was, how do I now move from my usual norm to a new normal? And UTLO provided a number of workshops which helped us with really getting into greater detail on Moodle and its different abilities or tools that we could use from really arranging your Zoom meetings to doing assessments via quizzes and also doing chat discussions with your students. And then there was also Cultura, which helped me a lot in recording my lectures. And I was able to have students see me and also engage with the slides at the same time. Then there was Moodle, which we, I used a lot to upload all the slides and upload all the videos that had been uh, uh, created using Cultura. Direct instruction, of course, was limited. However, it could be explored in the online system, so I used that to engage with the students. But however, I had to keep these as short as possible, and I'll explain why with my challenges. When we look at medical imaging, medical imaging tends to be limited for, for the health science and medical science students. They were able to be exposed to that through radiology lectures, so they were able to really be instructed and were given knowledge through lectures and also do it in a self-directed manner. Plastic and life models, these could not be interfaced with by students, which was a difficulty because they could not then see the structures and be able to touch. The post-COVID experience, interestingly, this semester we were able to open our doors and allow some of the students to come back on site while others can also still engage online. Me, I adopted an option where some of the students do come back if they're mature. I deal with first and some second year students. So some points they come for on-site lectures, they are coming for their dissections on site and they're still having online lectures and I engage with them also online for question and answer sessions to break down difficult concepts. So you see that there's a mix of both Cultura as an online software, traditional face-to-face -face is also being used. We also still place, I'm still placing slides on Moodle. And there's also an interface when they're on site with prosected specimens, with models, with osteological banks of specimens, which allows the students to fully experience both now the, the traditional side and the electronic side of learning. What I've noticed in my reflecting in relation to what other anatomists have used around the world, I see that we use similar tools. However, there's differences because of the resources that are available. I didn't have access to augmented reality and, and virtual reality. However, we have a resource like the anatomy table, which allows me to connect from the, um, the practical and also broadcast that to the students online. Benefits of it would are good and some were not so good. In the context of South Africa, Yes, students get to be self-paced in their learning. However, some are young, first years and second years, are not used to self-pacing, hence that comes with difficulty. Comfortable environments, some of the environments I engaged in the students were not so comfortable because the home setting was not conducive for the student to be able to engage with lectures and to be also have enough study time as they would in a residence, for instance. Lower costs, yes, lo costs were lowered. Students didn't have to pay for accommodation, didn't have to travel to campus. However, if we visit that to a cost of when you didn't have a conducive environment that allowed you to flourish, there may have been a higher cost to pay. In conclusion, I use the analogy of supine position because lying flat resembles rest and trusting and being stable in what you're about to experience that's abnormal. The back speaks of maintaining posture and for me it meant having strength to face the new realities. Face up reflected for me looking ahead and being hopeful of what is to come in a new COVID world and thereafter. Therefore, I am a survivor. I survived. And I have learned that I ought to trust myself because I've survived a lot already and I will survive whatever is coming. Therefore, in future, I tend to not allow the waves of change to knock me off and put me in a prone position, but I choose instead to learn how to ride the waves of change and so in them. Thank you so much.